In this video, we're going to talk about the complex exponential function. Before we do that, let's talk about what we know. We know lots about the real exponential function. So I'll call it f, and you input a real number, and it outputs a positive real number. And its formula is just e to the x. And we know from college algebra and calculus what its graph looks like. So it is this uh, curve over here to the left that's in green. It's got y-intercept 0, 1, and I know the point 1 comma e is on the graph. And let's go ahead and collect a lot more properties of the real exponential function that we know. So the first property we'll write down is that uh, we've got a whole bunch of exponent rules that uh, this thing satisfies. So like e to the x1 plus x2 should be e to the x1 times e to the x2. And there's a bunch more that you probably remember. Uh, the next property is that this function is 1 to 1. The next property is that this function is onto the interval 0 to infinity. Of course, it's not onto the whole real numbers. Uh, and so, so, you know, the exponential from r to 0 to infinity, um, this is one of those things, too, where, like, there's just as many real numbers from 0 to infinity as there are total real numbers. One of those kind of funny, challenging things for some people to, to wrap their minds around. So these two sets, the real numbers, and the interval from 0 to infinity have the same cardinality. Like, the exponential demonstrates that. Um, what else though? So it's your favorite function from calculus because the derivative of e to the x is just itself. Maybe to say that in a little bit more detail, um, e to the x is the unique function that satisfies the differential equation y prime equals y such that the y-intercept is you know at 0 comma 1. So that's the only function that's its own derivative and goes to the point 0 comma 1. The sequence of polynomials of the following form, so P0 is just the constant 1, P1 is the polynomial 1 plus x, that linear thing, P2 is this quadratic 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial, etc. The nth one is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial, plus keep going, you know, continue that pattern, and just at the very end, add on x to the n over n factorial. So that sequence of polynomials uniformly converges to this function e to the x for all real numbers x. So that's kind of a, a real analysis way to talk about um, kind of naturally where does e to the x come from. It is the limit of these polynomials uh, in the uniform norm. So another way to say that, or what that implies rather, is that uh, e to the x, um, it, it has this power series. So it's, it's again, like we said above, it should be the limit of adding up all the polynomials of that form. And so we could write it as the series. And that series holds for all inputs x. So that's a good representation of that function no matter what the real number x is. Uh, and then another property of the real exponential that we know and love is that its inverse is this function called the natural log, and we denote it by ln. And its inputs are positive real numbers from 0 to infinity, and it outputs any real number. Um, and so what we're saying here is that saying y equals e to the x is equivalent to saying natural log of y gives you back x. And what that tells us also, if I think about these inverse properties, if you take the natural log of e to the x, that should give you x back. And uh, vice versa, e to the natural log of x should give you x back as well, where you got to be careful. So like the, the formula we just wrote down, that holds as long as x is, you know, a positive real number since you're plugging into natural log first. Anyway, though, like you remember from calculus, you said that they undo each other. They cancel each other out is what my students like to say. It's like, OK, whatever helps you sleep at night. All right, cool. And if a is a positive real number, then a to the x, we can think of, you know, any exponential with, a, with you know, some other base, like 2 or 7, whatever, that can be rewritten with the base e. And so that allowed us to, you know, further develop, well, how do we take derivatives of, like, 7 to the x, right? We could use the rules and stuff we know for e to the x with, like, the chain rule, say. So a to the x is the same thing as e to the x times ln of a. Now, here's the new thing. What if we replace this real input x by a complex input z? So here's our definition of what the complex exponential is going to be. So if I take a complex number x plus i y, where x and y are real numbers, the complex exponential function is going to be defined as follows. So f of z, which is e to the z, and how do we do it? It's going to be e to the x, so that's e to the real part of z, times the quantity cosine of y plus i sine of y. So like the imaginary part of z is what goes into the trig functions there. And what I've colored in purple there is that could be expressed as e to the i y. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about properties of this function. And some of them, you know, line up exactly with the real exponential, which is good. Uh, and then we'll also see some kind of surprising things um, 
that's, uh, that happens with the complex exponential that we don't get with the real exponential. So the real part of e to the z, if you think about distributing that e to the x through, so the real part would be e to the x cosine of y, and the imaginary part of this function would be e to the x sine of y. Uh, the next property, if I took the modulus or the absolute value of e to the z, um, think about, again, applying the modulus to that formula above. You would get e to the x times the modulus of cosine of y plus i sine of y. But uh, cosine of y plus i sine of y, that's something that's, you know, on the unit circle. So its modulus is 1. So the modulus of e to the z is just e, e to the real part of z. So exponent rules and stuff still hold for the complex exponential. So like, you know, e to the z1 plus z2 is the same thing as e to the z1 times e to the z2, all that good stuff. Now, here's something that is different than the real exponential. The complex exponential is not one-to-one -one anymore. And so let me try to give you an example that demonstrates why. So if I plug in 0 plus 0i, that's e to the 0 times cosine of 0 plus i sine of 0, and that gives you 1. But also, if I plug in 0 plus 2 pi i, that's going to be e to the 0 times cosine of 2 pi plus i sine of 2 pi. But again, I just get 1 in that case. So I've got two different inputs, you know, 0 plus 0i and the other input 0 plus 2 pi i. And they give me the same output. So that demonstrates that this function is not 1 to 1. All right, and so let's maybe look into that in a little bit more detail. So there's some kind of repetitive or periodic nature to the complex exponential that I'm going to try to show you here. So if I look at the formula for e to the z, and I know it's e to the x cosine of y plus i sine of y. Remember, x is the real part of z, and y is the imaginary part of z. But I know that, you know, that's cosine and sine. That's real cosine and real sine that I know a lot about from trig. And I, I remember cosine and sine, they have period 2 pi. And so what I could do then, that tells me is that, oh, cosine of this is the same thing as cosine of this plus 2 pi, or any multiple of 2 pi. So I'm going to uh, use that here. So this is the same thing as e to the x times cosine of y plus 2k pi plus i sine of y plus 2k pi, where k is any integer here. And again, that's using the periodic nature of cosine and sine that I know about from, cal or from trig, say, or calc 1. Now let's rewrite that. So let's collapse that down. That's the same thing as e to the x times e to the i y plus 2k pi. And uh, if I use some exponent rules here, that's the same thing as e to the x plus i y plus i 2k pi. So I just distributed that y through. But now if I think about, well, the first two things together, that's just z. So this is e to the z plus i 2k pi. And finally, that's the same thing as plugging z plus i 2k pi into f. And if you look on the far left at the top, we started with f of z, and we showed that's equal to f of z plus i 2k pi, and that holds for all integers k. And so from that, we deduce that uh, this function, the complex exponential, its period is 2 pi i. So it's periodic, there's some kind of repetitive nature, and its period is 2 pi i. Interesting. So that suggests that some care is going to, uh, you know, need to be taken in order to later talk about what on earth would the complex logarithm look like. Since I don't have a one-to-one -one function, we're going to have to talk about, you know, restricting the domain of the exponential in order to, to come up with what a good uh, uh, inverse would be. But that's a later video. <laughs> So what else is going on with the complex exponential? Uh, it's definitely not onto all the complex numbers. Uh, for the same reason the real exponential wasn't onto all real numbers, something like e to the z equals zero doesn't have a solution. There's no z that makes that work. Now the derivative of the complex exponential is still just e to the z, and that's kind of remarkable. So that's a cool property that's enjoyed by both the complex exponential and the real exponential. And we haven't done, you know, like a formal proof in this video, so maybe now's a good time to do one. So let's prove why this still works. So we know that, uh, well, e to the z is the same thing as e to the x cosine of y plus i e to the x sine of y. And I'm trying to demonstrate with the colors or, or bring your attention with the colors to the real part of this function in blue, we'll call that u, and the imaginary part of this function in pink, and we'll call that v. And what we're going to do is we're going to check out the Cauchy-Riemann equations. So we'll look at the partial derivatives. So let's just look at our formula and let's just get those partial derivatives. So when I take the partial derivative of u with respect to x, I just get e to the x cosine of y back. When I take the partial derivative of u with respect to y, I get minus e to the x sine of y back. When I take the partial of v with respect to y, I get e to the x cosine of y. And when I take the partial derivative of v with respect to x, I get e to the x sine of y. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the top two equations. They're the same. 
So ux is the same thing as vy. Partial of u with x is the same thing as the partial of u with respect to y. And the bottom two equations tell me that the partial of u with respect to y is the opposite, has the opposite sign of the partial of u with respect to x. And of course, these two equations that are to the right of the arrows, those are the cauchy riemann equations. And what we just showed is that it didn't matter what x and y were. Those two equations are true for all x and y. And so the CR equations are true for all complex numbers, for all x plus i, y. I don't know why I have a z there. That, of course, should be a c for complex numbers. And what else do I know? You know, these partial derivatives are like, a, you know, exponentials times trig functions. You could differentiate those as many times as you want. So they're infinitely differentiable. Another word for that is smooth. And so uh, that was a case that allowed us to, that extra condition, sorry, is what allowed us to conclude that uh, this function is entire. All right, so remember the cauchy riemann equations holding weren't, weren't necessarily enough to say that something uh, is entire. So like part, like it has to be true, but a little bit more has to be true in order to say a function's entire. And this, this extra condition that the partial derivatives, you know, at least have to exist and be continuous, even better here, they're smooth. You know, that's the extra condition for me to say that this complex function is entire. Maybe you don't remember what entire means. So entire meant that it's analytic for all complex numbers or it's holomorphic for all complex numbers. And uh, over to the right here, what I'm saying to you, what does entire mean? For any complex number z naught, so I'll just plop a z naught in the complex plane, the derivative should exist at z naught, but even better, to say it's holomorphic there or analytic there, more has to be true. Not only does the derivative has to exist at that particular point z naught, we also need to be able to draw a sufficiently small little disk around that point, and f prime needs to exist at all points within that disk as well. So again, that was the extra condition uh, why differentiable is different than holomorphic, or differentiable is different than analytic. So again, just so we're clear, I'm using holomorphic and analytic interchangeably, but you know, some books like one word versus the other. All right, finally, what is the derivative of the complex exponential going to be? And so, uh, sorry, I'll go back up a little bit here. I know the formula for the derivative is just the partial of x, the partial of u with respect to x, plus i times the partial of v with respect to x. And if I just take a look from my work with the Cauchy-Riemann equations, that's just going to be e to the x cosine of y plus i times e to the x sine of y. And that, of course, is just e to the z. So we just proved that the derivative of e to the z is just e to the z. Uh, and the Cauchy-Riemann equations told me um, that that formula is true all the time. Uh, one more thing here, the complex exponential, it agrees with the real exponential. So what do I mean by that? If you plug in a real number in for z, so something that has the form x plus 0i, then what we're hoping is that we recover you know, the real exponential that we know and love from calculus or college algebra. And so let's check it out. So e to the z, in the case that z is just x plus 0i, if I plug that into you know, e to the x cosine of y plus i sine of y, that's e to the x cosine of 0 plus i sine of 0. And of course, uh, inside the parentheses, that all just collapses down to 1. So I just get e to the x out of this. So e to the z is the same thing as e to the x whenever z is equal to x. So wow, that does not sound very, uh, it's hard to argue with when you say it that way. But again, here's the proof that the complex exponential agrees with the real exponential when you have a real input. So now we're going to look at how does e to the z transform the complex plane. So in black here, I've got some z's, and we're going to look at what happens when you plug those black grid lines into the complex exponential, and that's these blue grid lines here. By the way, there's a link to this calculator in the description below. Give the author some love. It's not made by me. So if I make this black grid line a little bit bigger, notice that the complex exponential, those grid lines get bigger too, right? The modulus is increasing. Also, if I just move the black grid line toward the right, again, the x is increasing, so the modulus of the complex exponential is increasing. And if I move to the left in the negative x direction, that decreases the modulus of the complex exponential, so the blue grid lines get smaller. If I move straight up, right, the modulus stays the same, so the size of the grid lines don't change, but notice there's some counterclockwise rotation. And if I move downward, right, if just y is changing in the negative direction, I just get uh, clockwise rotation. So if I put it together to demonstrate uh, both of these, if I go in the positive x and positive y, modulus gets bigger and clock counterclockwise rotation. If I go in the negative x direction and positive y, again, the modulus shrinks, but you're still going counterclockwise. 